Two nations set out to master the same machine, but American and Japanese outboards became radically different for a reason few boaters understand. In Japan, engineers like Janichi Kawakami enforced total discipline. Every worker could shut down the assembly line, chasing reliability at any cost. Across the ocean, American brands pushed for raw power and flashy speed until lawsuits and market shocks blurred the lines forever. The rivalry sent shockwaves through boating culture, and its consequences are still at play every time an engine starts. But what really drove the divide, and who paid the price for it? Inside Yamaha's factory in 1960, the air was thick with tension and the smell of fresh-cut aluminum. Janichi Kawakami, a former piano engineer, watched as a handful of workers assembled the company's first outboard motor, the P7. The team had little more than foreign catalogs in their own stubborn discipline. Every bolt, every gasket, every gear was checked and rechecked. If a single worker spotted a flaw, the entire assembly line stopped, no matter the cost or deadline. This was Kaizen in its rawest form, a system where improvement was a daily ritual, not a slogan. The process was slow, almost agonizing, but it bred a kind of pride that ran deeper than any marketing campaign. The P7 wasn't a triumph. Early engines sputtered and failed in the test tanks, sometimes running for just a few hours before breaking down. But each failure was logged, dissected, and corrected. Workers gathered at the end of every shift, trading notes and suggestions, each voice carrying equal weight, an approach unheard of in most factories of the era. Kawakami insisted on these rituals, convinced that reliability had to be built from the ground up, not added as an afterthought. As the months dragged on, the team's patience was tested. The outside world saw only missed deadlines and flawed prototypes. Inside, though, a new discipline was taking root, one that would define Yamaha's reputation for decades. The first launch of the P7 was quiet, almost anonymous, but it marked the moment when process overtook power as the soul of Japanese outboard engineering. In the late 1970s, OMC's legal department prepared a thick stack of filings against Yamaha. The accusation was patent infringement on two-stroke outboard designs. OMC's attorneys argued that Japanese engines were little more than copies, built on stolen blueprints and borrowed ideas. The stakes were clear. If OMC succeeded, Yamaha's outboards could be blocked from the United States market, and their American ambitions would be cut short before they began to grow. Courtrooms filled with technical diagrams and sworn testimony. But as the litigation dragged on, something unexpected began to happen outside the courthouse. Dealers who had once sold nothing but Evan Rood and Johnson started placing Yamaha signs in their windows. Some were lured by quiet reliability, others by the promise of fewer warranty claims and less time spent on repairs. The backlash was immediate. OMC loyalists called these early defectors traitors, accusing them of undermining American industry. Yet the numbers told a different story. By 1982, dozens of United States dealerships had switched sides, betting their future on engines that ran longer and broke less often. Inside Yamaha, the legal threat became a daily pressure test. Engineers doubled their efforts to audit every component, every process, determined to avoid even a hint of infringement. Settlements were paid, royalties bought the right to keep selling, but the real payment was in discipline. Each lawsuit forced Yamaha to refine its technology to make engines that were not just legal, but legendary for their longevity. The courtroom battles did not stop the Japanese advance. They forged its reputation. By the time the final settlements were signed, the outboard market had begun to shift not just in branding, but in the very definition of reliability. Honda entered the outboard market with a quiet confidence that caught competitors off guard. Instead of chasing horsepower records, Honda engineers adapted their four-stroke automotive engines for marine use, 
a move that seemed almost playful compared to the muscle flexing of American brands. Their first four-stroke outboards, launched in the 1960s and refined through the 1980s, ran smoother and cleaner than anything else on the water. Honda's VTEC technology, borrowed from its legendary car engines, gave boaters a taste of precision tuning and low emissions. The company did not shout about speed or torque. Instead, it promised engines that would start every time, run quietly, and sip fuel. For many, this was a new kind of trust, one built on consistency rather than spectacle. Suzuki, meanwhile, took a different route. Where Honda played the role of the quiet innovator, Suzuki staked its reputation on value and versatility. Their outboards were competitively priced, offering features that rivaled Yamaha and Honda, but at a cost that appealed to both first-time buyers and commercial operators. Suzuki's engineers focused on practical improvements, easy maintenance, corrosion resistance, and engines that could handle long days in salt water without complaint. By the late 1980s, Suzuki had become a favorite among charter captains and fishing guides who needed reliable power without breaking the bank. Honda and Suzuki did not just compete with each other or with Yamaha. They carved out distinct personalities in a market crowded with bold claims. Honda promised refinement and peace of mind. Suzuki delivered smart value and rugged dependability. These brand roles would soon be tested as American manufacturers prepared to defend their home turf, setting the stage for a new kind of rivalry on the water. At Lake X in 1957, the rules did not matter. Mercury's test crews arrived with crates of spare pistons, steel tools, and enough gasoline to keep the water oily for days. The lake's location was a secret, no maps, no directions, just a promise of isolation and the chance to push engines past their limits. Company founder Carl Key Kiefer demanded more than just performance numbers. He wanted spectacle. Engines ran nonstop, day and night, until parts warped, bearings screamed, and test drivers swapped shifts with bloodshot eyes. The logs from those days read like war diaries, with cracked gear cases, melted pistons, repair after repair. But when Mercury's advertising campaign launched, none of that showed. The public saw only the survivors, outboards that had supposedly run 50,000 miles without a hiccup. Banners boasted Lake X, where only the toughest engines survive. Test crews became legends in their own right, known for their bravado and stubborn pride. Some wrapped their hands in duct tape to keep working through blisters. Others slept in boats, listening to engines hammer through the night. The real story was risk. Engines pushed to the brink, mechanics gambling with every tweak, all for the sake of building an image that screamed American power. Every successful run fueled the myth that Mercury outboards were unbreakable, even if the truth was far messier. The fallout from these trials shaped more than just marketing. Engineers took what broke at Lake X and raced to fix it, sometimes inventing new alloys or redesigning entire components before the next round of tests. The tension between showmanship and real durability became Mercury's calling card, a brand built on the edge, daring the competition to keep up. In the world of American outboards, Risk was not just accepted, it was the whole point. Mercury's obsession with innovation often meant racing ahead of the competition and sometimes past the limits of what the technology could handle. The Optimax project, launched in 1998, was supposed to redefine two-stroke efficiency. Instead, it became a cautionary tale. Early Optimax engines promised lower emissions and better fuel economy but warranty records from 1998 to 2003 tell a different story. Thousands of units were recalled for failed air compressors, injector problems, and catastrophic piston scoring. Dealers scrambled to replace parts, and customers faced weeks without their boats during the peak of summer. The technical gamble cost Mercury millions in repairs and lost goodwill. Internal documents show that management pushed for a rapid rollout to beat new EPA rules, 
but the rush left little room for field testing. Every breakdown became a lesson in the price of speed. The pattern did not end with Optimax. Years later, Mercury engineers gathered around prototypes of the Verado V12, a 600-horsepower behemoth with a steerable gear case and a two-speed transmission, features never before seen in a production outboard. Development logs from 2016 to 2021 reveal a cycle of late-night test runs and emergency redesigns. The complexity was staggering. More moving parts, more sensors, more things that could go wrong. Early adopters reported software glitches, shifting issues, and sensor failures. Some problems were fixed with updates, others required entire assemblies swapped under warranty. The Verado V12 dazzled on paper and in magazine tests, but the real-world rollout was anything but smooth. Mercury's management believed that bold engineering would keep them ahead, but the fallout from rushed launches and technical overreach left scars. Recalls, warranty claims, and frustrated owners became the hidden cost of chasing the next breakthrough. For every headline grabbing innovation, there was a trail of paperwork and hard lessons in the background. Proof that in the American outboard world, risk and consequence have always traveled together. The announcement landed like a thunderclap in the middle of the pandemic. On May 27, 2020, BRP stunned the marine world by shutting down Evinrude outboard production. For nearly 120 years, Evinrude had been the name on America's transoms. A brand born in old Evinrude's Wisconsin workshop, grown into a symbol of blue-collar ingenuity and weekend freedom. But the final memo from BRP was blunt. No more engines, no more jobs, no more Evinrude. Workers at the Sturdivant plant emptied their lockers some leaving behind decades of service and family tradition. Dealers scrambled to cancel orders or find new suppliers. Industry analysts called it the end of the American two-stroke era, a closing chapter written not by engineering failure, but by a world that had moved on. The irony was impossible to ignore. Even as the last Evinrude rolled off the line, Mercury's portable and mid-range outboards still draped in stars and stripes, were quietly being assembled in Japan. Since 1988, Mercury's contract with Tohatsu had turned a Japanese manufacturer into the silent engine room for American-branded motors under 60 horsepower. Tohatsu's Komagani factory now churned out tens of thousands of Mercury-badged engines each year, their castings and gear cases stamped with Japanese cereals. Their assembly lines run by workers with no ties to Wisconsin or Florida. The same plant supplied small leaven roots until the very end, and for a time, even Nissan branded outboards for the United States market. For industry veterans, the collapse of Evinrude and the rise of Tohatsu's supply contracts felt like a strange twist of fate. The brand that once defined American self-reliance now depended on overseas manufacturing to survive. The old boundaries, East and West, American and Japanese, had blurred into a single global supply chain. What mattered most was no longer the flag on the cowling, but the reliability of the engine beneath it. The story of outboards had become a story of interdependence, with every contract and shutdown reshaping who built what and for whom. In early 2021, a shipment of microcontrollers bound for an outboard assembly plant in Tennessee vanished into a global log jam. Production lines, once humming with the steady rhythm of assembly, fell silent as managers scrambled to source parts from anywhere they could. The chip shortage hit both American and Japanese brands with the same cold force. Orders for Mercury and Yamaha engines piled up in dealer backrooms while factory supervisors tracked the arrival of each crate of semiconductors like a lifeline. Some plants rerouted shipments by air, paying triple for overnight delivery just to keep the lines moving. Others rewrote software to accept alternate chips, risking glitches in engines that would soon be tested on open water. Tariffs added another layer of strain. Between 2018 and 2024, new import taxes on Chinese-made components forced companies to redraw their maps. 
Yamaha ramped up assembly in Georgia and Tennessee, bringing in unfinished engines from Japan and finishing them on American soil. Mercury shifted orders between Wisconsin, Japan, and Thailand, chasing cost advantages that changed with every policy shift and currency swing. The badge on the engine told only part of the story. The real engine was a patchwork, built from parts that had crossed oceans, borders, and time zones. Inside Yamaha's U.S. plants, managers kept a close eye on supplier spreadsheets. Each delay meant a risk of missed shipments to dealers, or a scramble to substitute a fuel injector sourced from Denso with one from Bosch. At Mercury's Fond du Lac facility, the story was the same. One missing ECU could stall an entire week of production. Plant supervisors became experts in logistics, learning to hedge bets across multiple vendors, always one step ahead of the next shortage. By the summer of 2022, the old notion of national brands had faded. Engines stamped made in USA or assembled in Japan owed their existence to a web of factories, suppliers, and shipping routes that spanned the globe. The outboard world had become a lesson in hidden dependencies, where every storm in the South China Sea or fire in a Taiwanese chip plant sent ripples through American lakes and Japanese harbors alike. Charter captains in Florida, ferry operators in Okinawa, and rental fleet managers in Sydney all keep the same kind of logbook, a ledger of fuel receipts, oil changes, and repair bills. Over thousands of hours, a pattern emerges. The real cost of running a modern outboard, whether American or Japanese, lands between $1.50 and $2.70 per hour. Every brand promises something different, but the numbers rarely lie. Yamaha's F300, for example, averages $1.50 to $2.10 per hour in mixed-use fleets, with most of the expense coming from fuel and routine service. Mercury's Verado 300, built for speed and loaded with tech, runs higher, $2 to $2.70 per hour, driven up by pricier parts and more complex maintenance. Suzuki's DF300 splits the difference, offering reliability close to Yamaha at a price that appeals to commercial operators with costs in the $1.80 to $2.20 per hour range. For the people who depend on these engines, Reliability isn't just a selling point, it's the difference between profit and loss. Fleet owners talk about engines that run 3,000 hours without a major breakdown and the quiet pride that comes from a year with no emergency haulouts. Depreciation matters too. Japanese engines, especially Yamaha, often hold their value better in high-use markets, shaving a few cents off the hourly cost. But the gap has narrowed. American brands, once known for big power and big problems, have closed in on fuel efficiency and longevity. The badge matters less than the spreadsheet. Underneath the rivalry, a silent exchange has taken place. Mercury's newest models borrow fuel-saving tricks from Yamaha, while Japanese engineers study American advances in digital controls and performance tunes. The lines have blurred even further with electrification. Mercury, Yamaha, Honda, and Suzuki are all pouring money into hybrid and electric outboards, chasing quieter, cleaner power. The future generation of engines will be built on lessons borrowed from both sides, precision, endurance, and a willingness to rethink what an outboard should be. For the operators who live by the hour meter, the future promises more choices, lower costs, and a world where reliability and performance finally share the same page. Today, choosing an outboard isn't just about speed or efficiency, it's about which values steer the future of boating. As global supply chains blur national lines, those original philosophies still drive innovation and loyalty. The real divide isn't in the engines themselves, but in what boaters expect from progress. Sometimes the water reveals not just where we go, but why we choose to go differently.